Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Pray First Conversation. We have Monday through Friday right here on the Pastor Doug page. My name is Dennis, and I'm with you again on Tuesday. We're finishing up our uh, Bible study, our small group study for, I've called Kingdom Disciples, Tony Evans Bible study. We've had a six-week campaign, and it's really good to, to get it behind us, but it's been good while we're in it. Man, the uh, fellowship had with my group was fantastic. I thank all you guys for being there with me on Sundays at 2. Uh, if you're if you're watching this at the 7 o'clock hour, if you would, hashtag live. If you're watching at any other time, hashtag recorded. And if you're sharing this out on social media, hashtag share. So thankful that you guys are with us every day of the week like this. Uh, we Like I say, we've been in a six-week small group campaign for different groups meeting, uh, mostly on the weekends or close, close to the weekends. And then this next week, we have uh, devotionals related to, or if you will, sub-studies related to the one that we had the previous week. <clears throat> so it's so good to have you guys here. If you would give some hearts and likes to anyone, our new folks, people visiting maybe, maybe your first time to come on the Pastor Doug page. Now, if any of you would give out hearts and likes to welcome everyone in. Those are for you guys. Uh, if you're here visiting, uh, I'm one of the pastors at Cross Point Church, and I get the privilege to be with you uh, one day a week, usually on Tuesdays, to share the Word or to read the Word. Uh, we, we've also had the Bible Project happening where we've been reading through the Bible, not in any particular order, but we're using the message version. But we're going to finish up this week, Kingdom Disciples. It's, like I say, it's been a six-week study, and we, man, it's been really good. Now, this week was titled Church and Community. And this particular, yesterday, Pastor Brandy uh, shared the church's role in Kingdom Disciple. The church's role with all of us together. And today, I get the, the exciting experience to share the four vital experiences of the church. And we're going to dig into that. Ben Acts 2, uh, really good uh, book to study if you want to study one about the early church, about the beginnings of the or the church. So welcome everyone here. I've let everybody that's gotten in the room, more may come on, but we're going to go ahead and start. And I'm going to take care of one little piece of business before we get going. <clears throat> All right, we're on page 143 in the, uh, in the book, the, the, the uh, workbook. We're going to start reading. We've been reading some of these. We've been sharing, talking some of these, and uh, reading scriptures. So it's a really kind of a mix. But we're going to do a little reading as well. <clears throat> I'm at the top of 143. One of the most dynamic, influential churches of all time is described in Acts 2, which we read, read in yesterday's lesson. The church was vibrant and alive. It owned no buildings and had no loudspeakers, or parking lots. It didn't even have a complete Bible yet, just the Old Testament. Bookstores, brands, or Christian radio stations didn't exist, nor did full-time children's ministries, single ministries, or couples ministries. None of those programs were viewed as essential. They didn't even have, need them then, I'm thinking. Yet this church was on fire because it had the Holy Spirit himself. In fact, what what uh, uh, Dr. Evan talks about, he often feared, is that, that we program God out of the building with programs, with, with things we do. Uh, but when we don't program in time for with the Holy Spirit or being led by the Holy Spirit. And in our search for success in ministry, we may have missed the point entirely. <clears throat> Next paragraph. One reason the church in Acts was so dynamic is that it got off to a great start. Jesus had told the disciples in Acts 1.8, don't have church until the Holy Spirit shows up. That's paraphrased. He said, wait here until the, you come, you'll be endued with power from above when the Holy Spirit comes. So in Acts 2 reveals that this church was wildly influential in living out the reality of being Jesus' disciples. Let me read that one more time. This church was wildly influential in living out the reality of being Jesus' disciples. It did this through four vital spirit-inspired experiences that are necessities for churches 
that would follow Christ in kingdom discipleship. These experiences include outreach, teaching, fellowship, and worship. And then below there, it's where you can list, uh, list and define in your own words each of the four vital experiences of the local church. And that just goes into what we're what you would be, how you would put it in your words. So you can do that. Uh, if you haven't, you can do that uh, maybe later or as we go. Page 144, start with outreach. And I, I put that uh, that was witnessing and, and telling others about Jesus and his salvation, the plan of salvation. Telling them about God, introducing them to God through through your life, through your words, things like that. And that's my... my uh, Personal, I may be referring back to that where we define and find in our own words. <clears throat> so, if you're going to follow Christ as a disciple, you must be a witness. Witnessing is the way the church conducts outreach. Whether in your actions or your words, get that very close. Whether in your actions or your words, or your actions and your words. I think it's actions and words. Uh, whether, whether, whether in your actions or your words, you must represent the Lord in all that you do. People want to see your lifestyle. They want to, want to see if your word, if your lifestyle backs up your words. The believers who were in the upper room who received the Holy Spirit on Pentecost became witnesses. The result of their witness in Peter's sermon on that special day when the Holy Spirit came was the addition of 3,000 new believers to the body of Christ. <clears throat> Let's just soak that in for a minute. 3,000 people got saved. Notice that these 3,000 people didn't, didn't come because of an evangelistic program. <laughs> they didn't have time. They were waiting on the Holy Spirit. That was the only thing Jesus said, just wait. Wait till you can do with power to be my witnesses. They came because people were overwhelmed by the experience of the presence of his spirit. They were excited about Jesus. Their excitement erupted in great outreach and many people were saved. The early church's witness went beyond words. They saw the actions. They saw, and in, and in future events, they saw them give their lives for the cause of the gospel. Acts 2.43 says that everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. God witnessed not only in word, word through his disciples, but also in deed. They demonstrated the truthfulness and authenticity of the gospel in their works, which are the hallmarks of outreach. you got to go to people. You, you know, a pro, good program, evangelistic program, should minister to people's needs physically and spiritually. And sometimes emotional. And I think the emotion will come with that, uh, through that. All right, let's go to Romans 10, 14. And again, I go off screen when I do that. Done. 10, 14 says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? A uh, preacher there being someone to tell them, not someone who stands at a pulpit, not someone who's the uh, you know uh, the the head position or of our responsibility of pastor, but the person telling them about Jesus. Now, don't let that discourage you. Think, well, I'm not a preacher. No, you you can tell people about Jesus. You can live the life out before people. And why is it essential that we tell people about Jesus? Well, like I said, that how are they going to know unless you tell them? In other words, how are they going to know unless you live it out before them? How are they going to know unless they see something different about you than people in the world, than, than others who aren't saved? We don't put ourselves above people. We, we're above only in that we are covered in the blood of Jesus. We're saved by his grace and live under his mercy. So the question here is why is it important for church members to make evangelism and outreach a priority <clears throat> so folks can get saved. That's the bottom line. Uh, we, can, we can go to heaven hungry. We can't go to heaven without being saved. You can, go to, you can go to heaven poor, but hey, can't go to heaven without being saved. But we can be rich in this world through the blessings of God, whether that be financial, you know, material, 
or spiritual, whatever, whatever those blessings of God are. With whom are you currently sharing the gospel or have done so in the past? You can answer that yourself. <clears throat> Let that be a question to yourself. All right, so we covered outreach. Now we'll go to teaching. And that goes along with this, this Romans 10, 14. How are they, how they going to know unless you tell them? And you have to be taught how to tell them. So teaching. And it, the, script, the, the verse, the uh, paragraph says, along with their dynamic witness, dynamic, it changed with each, it's different with each person. Everybody's different. You share the gospel differently with different people. There's a way that somebody shared the gospel with me that was different than they shared it with someone else. If you're, if you're, whatever you say, you're, your hobby, you're a pilot, you're a motorcycle enthusiast, what, whatever, you know, what you do, your job. I shared the gospel when I was, I was a delivery driver in a truck. And I came in contact with a lot of people, had opportunity to share Jesus. And I had some repeat deliveries, and they watched to see how I conducted myself, especially if I shared Jesus with them. So uh, early believers were growing in their knowledge of God's word, very vital. They were continually exposing themselves to the information and application, information, and application of God's word through teaching, information, application. So the word requires a response. Knowledge, that, having that knowledge requires a response. Acts two forty two, uh, part of that scripture. Let's let's go back to that. To Acts two forty two. Says and they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and fellowship and the breaking bread and in prayer. So we're going to be using that scripture in the whole scripture. But first part, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. <clears throat> we're on page 145. See, so the believers were taught day by day just as people were being saved day by day. They were taught day by day. See, so do you notice the correlation here? People were being saved every day. The followers were devoting themselves to the teaching of the word every day. One had an impact on the other. One had an impact on the other. Uh, to live as a kingdom disciple, the word of God must be as necessary and desirable for the, for the spirit as food is for the body. We have to feed the, the spirit. We have to feed it on the word of God. Each of us, not just those with the high calling of teaching God's Word, needs to commit our time and energy to the study of God's Word through the teaching of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's job is to reveal the Word to us. And Jesus said this, and we talked about this in my group Sunday, that the Spirit would remind us of all He taught us. See, I'll bring all things to your remembrance, the things which I have taught you. We worry sometimes about I know some folks that can quote you the scripture and the address where it's located in the Bible. I may not be able to do that, but the Holy Spirit has brought scriptures to my mind and things I needed in talking with someone, not arguing, just sharing the gospel or ministering someone, counseling. And I know that, that, that the Holy Spirit will do that, but we need to study it. We need to remember, he'll bring, remind us, remember Bring those things to our remembrance. We need to read and study it. We need to listen. We need to see it. We need to, to do those things. Live it out. That way it's in our hearts. If we hide it in our hearts, we're going to live it out. All right, let's go to 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 it says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the person, man of God, person of God, may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So we're talking about four things that God does that the Word of God, God does the four things that the Word of God accomplishes. Let me get that straight. The four things that the Word of God accomplishes. Number one, the Word of God is good for doctrine. To acquire a taste, you know, you have to, and then reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness, and then that would be fully equipped. So um, we'll read underneath the four things there that you write in. <clears throat> it says, to acquire a taste for Bible study, 
Sometimes that can be a daunting task. I was fortunate. I got saved and had such a hunger for the Word. I didn't care if I understood it right then or not. I wanted to read it. And then I'd hear it preached. And then I'd, I'd talk to others about it. And then I began to understand it. Uh, the, to acquire a taste for Bible study, you'll have to discipline yourself to sit down and read whether or not you feel like reading. The more time you spend in the Word, the more you'll understand. And it's, see, the more you hear it, the more you see it, the more you read it, the more you do it, the more you understand. And the more you understand, the more you'll want to read. I found that true in my life. The more I understand it, the more I want to read it and understand it. Instead of waiting, say, so you know you're becoming a kingdom disciple when you're in the Word day by day. You know, that's a good sign of being a disciple. Is you're in that Word daily, you're, you're, you're reading it, you're studying it, you're meditating on it day by day. Instead of waiting until Sunday so that somebody else can feed you, you're learning to feed yourself. And we, we refer to that as self feeder now, it doesn't mean you get everything for yourself, but you get it. You begin to feed yourself again to get in that word for yourself. Even if you've heard a sermon on Sunday, like Sunday, uh, a fantastic sermon that Pastor Doug preaches, get in there for yourself and read it. Study about that. Read about that. Confirm those things on the paper. Read those scriptures. Go back over them. <clears throat> the study. I like that because we study it for ourselves. We, and, you know, we watch the videos. We watch those in our groups. And then we talk about them, but then you go in and study for yourself. You look at them. We would talk about them and discuss those things, but then we would go further. And these, these dailies were designed so that we could go in daily. And we're just talking about them here. Thank, thank you for letting me do that with you guys each, each week. So uh, you're reading Scripture, meditating on it, and asking the Holy Spirit to guide you. Asking the Holy Spirit to guide us. That's important. That the Holy Spirit reveal to us meanings of Scripture and guide us to who we need to share it with, what we need to do to accomplish what Scripture is saying, to act out, to do, to do the works. When the Word of God is precious to you, or is important, when it's important to you, you're on your way. Church should light the fire. Church should light you the fire, but you have to fan the flame. You ever started a campfire? And you get it going a little bit, and, and then you got to blow on it. Hopefully you don't get real close and it flare up on you, but you got to blow on those sparks and that, those coals and get them up, and they begin to make a fire. And then it does its own blow. It just draws air and oxygen in and blows it out and gets a, a fire going. Will you commit to study God's Word on a daily basis if you aren't already doing so? Man, that's a great commitment. Make it to God. Make it to yourself. Just to at least read something every day at some point from the Bible and then think on it, study on it, talk about it, share about it. The next dynamic, or uh, yeah, the next experience is fellowship. So we've had witnessing or outreach, we've had teaching, and now we've got fellowship. And these are all dynamics of the early church. They had all these dynamics, <coughs> excuse me, in the early church. So the third vital experience of the church, and I'm at the bottom of page 145, is found in Acts 2.42 as well. Along with devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, the believers were devoted to fellowship. And that, uh, let me go back to that and just read it real quick, 2.42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in breaking of bread and in prayers. They prayed together as well. How about that? How about that, folks? They 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 worship, I and mean, we get into worship too. But they they had church together. They fellowship together. The third vital experience of the church is found in Acts two forty two fellowship with devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, the, the believe, believers were devoted to fellowship. The Greek word for fellowship literally means to share something in common with others. It means being a part of a common family of sorts. In other words, you have things in common. You find someone you have a lot in common with, you want to talk with them, you want to talk about those things you have in common. You talk about that. And that's the way the Word of God, we should have that in common. And, and especially if we've been a, 
a believer for and a disciple for a long time, then we need someone who hasn't been. We need to be willing to share with them and not to cut them off because they can't quote it just exactly like I do or explain it. No. Talk with them. Share with them. Help them. Mentor someone. And that doesn't mean you got to be with them 24-7. <clears throat> All right, we're on page 146. <clears throat> Fellowship is sharing our lives with other believers. You'll never grow to full maturity in Jesus Christ all alone. It happens in a dynamic of doing this with others, whether that be in the church building, in the church at large, outside the building, in our homes, house to house, in our jobs, at the grocery store. You're shopping. You may see someone shopping shops at the same time you do every week. Goes to that grocery store, bravely walks down those aisles and, uh, and shops. Found something that I don't really like doing, <laughs> but I do it sometimes. And then there's always some man that said, if you just be aware of your surroundings, you know, uh, security officers, policemen, they, uh, when they're taught, they're taught to be aware of your surroundings. And I had s some firearms training when I worked for a armored car company. And the, and the guy that taught us firearms, he said, <clears throat> be aware of your surroundings. Look around you, see what's going on. He took us to a restaurant and uh, we were eating, and he pointed out some things, and he said how he sat, what he looked for, things he, he noticed. And that's the same way with, with being a disciple. Go out and live in this world. See, we'd be, Jesus said we'd be in the world but not of the world. Be out there in the world, but be looking for opportunities to do good to someone. Maybe help them out. Reach that something that's up higher. Ask them where something is. I've done that before. Hey, where's the spices? You know, they... I think when they know I'm coming, they change where they're at in the store so that it makes it hard for me to find them. So uh, if you work there, don't you change them when I'm coming in there. <clears throat> so there's no such thing as a lone ranger, Christian, or disciple who, who, uh, who's a growing, active disciple of Christ. There's no such thing. There's no lone ranger. It's not my Father who is in heaven. What is it, folks? Jesus instructed us to pray, Our Father who is in heaven. Jesus instructed us to pray, pray that, and that's in Matthew 6, 9. You can't become a disciple of Jesus Christ independently of others. The necessity of Christian fellowship is one, is one reason the church is so important. It gives us that opportunities for fellowship. Uh, we, we look for ways to give people opportunities to, to serve. That's part of the, the, the structure of the church and leadership is to, to work together to perform opportunities, look for opportunities, make, make them available, and, and to go and do them together. <clears throat> the necessity of Christian fellowship is one reason the church is so important. It's the fireplace where one log touches another and the fire is continually rekindled. Think of a fireplace, a, a campfire. In fact, the church in Jerusalem shared not only their lives, but also their possessions, meeting any needs that arose in the body of Christ, and that's in Acts 2 as well. Sharing our resources is part of the fellowship too. Man, I'm, I'm with some folks that are givers. They, they, they give freely of their time and their possessions. Let's go to Ephesians uh, 4, 16 for the, for the last scripture. And it says, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. You want to go back and, and meditate on that. I'm going to read it one more time. From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So uh, how, that's how fellowship increases the strength of the whole body of Christ. And it has a question there after reading that scripture you can answer. Let's go to the last uh, ex experience here, vital experience, and that's worship. And not, not any less... In importance, uh, it's in, it's in, it's right, they're, they're all equal. These dynamics need to work together. 
The fourth vital experience of the church is to provide a context for worship to occur. I believe worship ought to occur not just in the building, but in our daily lives where we're worshiping God through reading His Word. Through, you know, all of these things can become an act of worship to God, devoting time to God, devoting your first 7 a.m. of these weekdays uh, as, a, as an act of worship and a sacrifice to God. Fourth vital experience of the church is to provide a context for worship to occur. The believers devoted themselves to the breaking of bread, celebrating the Lord's Supper, and to praying. You hear my new dog over here talking to me. She's saying, you got to hurry up. Uh, breaking of bread, which is celebrating the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. In verse 46 of two, Acts 2, we see that they were going to the temple every day and continually praising God. Worship is recognizing God for who he is, what he has done, and what we're trusting him to do. Uh, God is the focus of worship, the focal point, the focus. Praising God, worshiping him, and celebrating him for who he is and what he's done. And, 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 and get that gets God's attention. As we worship him and you feel the spirit and you feel it, man, I, when we're in worship together, we feel it together because we're all focal and we're all worshiping that one God, worshiping God, lifting up the name of Jesus, experiencing the Holy Spirit in our midst together. Now, I've lost my place. Uh, praising God, worshiping him. God responds to our worship, both public and private. Don't, don't miss a lot of opportunities where you can praise God in private and worship God in private. And don't miss the opportunities, folks. When we're together, it's not a light thing. It's not just, it's, it's the opening. God creates an atmosphere for us to receive his word through worship as well. God responds to our worship both public and private. If you want God's power in your life, worship must be part of your daily communion with him. Celebrate God and exalt him. Exalt him for who he is, what he's done, and what you're trusting him to do. <clears throat> there are times when I pray, if I'm praying for someone and, and uh, praying for a specific need, and I'll give God praise and worship, thank him for the answer to the prayer, whatever that answer may be. And that's not lack of faith. That's trusting God that we'll get what we need, maybe not what we want. So, again, thank you guys for being with me here uh, on the day twos of these sessions. I want to end this with this prayer. I encourage you to pray for one another and go back and look over these and see those dynamics in your church, wherever you might go to church. If you're visiting here, you may be on, in another country, but wherever you are at church, make sure these four experiences are happening in your church and be a part of them. Support them. Dear God, Lord, thank you for your four vital experiences. You've established and provided through the local church. I ask you to strengthen each ministry of my church and of our church so that it will be more effective in making disciples. Lord, we realize that there is the church globally. We have local congregations that we call church. We're part of a greater body of Christ, the church. Help me identify areas of my discipleship in which I need to grow as well. And ask all this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Love you guys. Have a fantastic day out there. Thank you for being with me. And uh, I'll see you next time. Bye.